So we want to go to renewable energies, pillar one, 20% renewables, a third of the electricity. Pillar two, we're going to convert the building stock to partial power plants. New buildings, positive power. Jumpstart the economy. Millions of jobs, because we have to convert the entire infrastructure of every urban area in the world. Then pillar three, we ran into a problem in Brussels. How do we store the energy? Because the wind isn't always blowing, and the sun isn't always shining, and the water tables can be down. These are intermittent energies. You know you're struggling with this right now, correct? Storage. So when Romano Prati was president of the commission, we sat down, and I said, Romano, this was 2003. I said, we got a little problem. If we wake up in 2020, and we know we're going to have a third of the electricity of Europe renewables, I, I need your help. I said, Romano, let me paint your little picture here. 2020, hot summer, bad luck. The cloud covers out over Europe for two weeks, no sun. Really bad luck, the wind stops blowing right at the same time. Super bad luck, the water tables are down on hydro because of climate change drought. <laughs> and I turned to Romano and I said, what do we do? And as you, if you know him, he's a very understated, magnificent gentleman. He simply looked at me and he said, that's an interesting point. <laughs> Didn't hear from him for two months. Then he introduced a 2 billion euro R&D for hydrogen. We're going to use all sorts of storage technologies, flywheels, batteries, capacitors, water pumping up here in Scandinavia. I'm for all of them. Hydrogen is a universal storage, however, because it's like digital and media. It's completely convertible. It's the basic element of the universe. It's not a primary energy. It carries other energy. And when you use it, the byproducts are water and heat. Our astronauts have been circling this planet for 30 years in those spaceships. And let me tell you, they're not powered by internal combustion engines. They're powered by high-tech hydrogen fuel cells. So this technology is not 100 years in the future. It's 30 years ago. Bring it back to every urban area. Put hydrogen storage across every building and across the utility infrastructure. So you put a little solar on your factory roof or a little wind, vertical wind. If you have a little excess electricity you don't need, Electrolyzed water, high school chemistry. You sat in this class, you don't even know this class. You didn't take chemistry. You slept like me. You put the anode and the cathode in the water. Okay, and the electricity comes out. I'm sorry, the hydrogen comes out, put it in a cell. When the solar is not on this gentleman's roof, you convert the hydrogen back to electricity. Now, don't come up afterwards and say, isn't that a thermodynamic loss? Where are my engineers? You know that every time you convert energy, you lose energy. It's the second law of thermodynamics. You never break even. You always lose. And if you knew the actual thermodynamic loss in converting oil, coal, gas, and uranium, it's through the roof. We just committed 8 billion euros to a public-private rollout of hydrogen across Europe. I spent some time with Chancellor Merkel in 2003. I said, we've got to go with this. She put in $500 million, and they just introduced a hydrogen infrastructure across Germany for 2014. Germany always seems to be right up there in front, way ahead, way ahead. So then we go to pillar four. This is where the communication revolution converges with the energy revolution to create a third industrial revolution for our great urban cities and then flagship out. We take the same technology that created the internet. It's identical. We take the power and transmission lines of the great urban areas and we turn them into intergrids that act exactly like the internet. So that when millions and millions and millions of buildings across regions and continents are producing just a little bit of their own electricity, if they don't need some of the surplus, they store it in hydrogen like we store digital in media. And if the price is right, they share it across entire continents. Just like we take information, store it in digital, and share it across intergrid, internets, internets, intergrids. This is power to the people. And it plugs in with transport and logistics, because in 2014, hybrid electric cars, trucks, and buses are coming out, electric, and fuel cell, both. Mass production, big six auto companies, fuel cell, electric cars, done deal. So now the utility companies are setting up deals with the car companies to put in power chargers across all the countries so that you power up in your buildings, and then wherever you are and you park, you can get electricity from the grid or take it back from the grid. The grid itself is connected to software and sensors. So first of all, we've got to make it digital. That's a huge infrastructure shift. It's all servo mechanical. Enel in Italy has now put in advanced meters across Italy in one year. 
so that you can have a digital meter and know how to send energy both ways, to the grid, from the grid. The grid itself, we have the first ones that are going up, first cities, just starting in the last six months. We connect all the software to appliances. So across Europe, we'll know what every washing machine's doing. So if there's too much demand, not enough supply of electricity, we can say to two, five, two million washing machines, forget the extra rinse cycle. If you bought the software for that program, you get a credit or a check from the utility company because you're a player. Dynamic pricing is going to be on the grid. You, you know, the price of electricity changes moment to moment, and if you knew it, you'd go ballistic. That's exactly what happened when the first grids went up in Washington State with IBM. You could see the price change, and people became obsessive compulsive. They'd say, oh my God, the price is going up. Turn off the damn TV. No TV. Get off the TV. No TV. Okay, turn on the washing machine. They didn't need Greenpeace. They saw the dial. The energy savings are through the roof. This is distributed capitalism. This is a lateral shift in capitalism. Everyone becomes a player. And for everyone under the age of 40 here, this makes common sense. You grew up in file sharing and you in, uh, in Wikipedia and Linux and open comments and collaborative social spaces. And I have to say, this is a generational shift, not a political shift. This is whether you think patriarchal and centralized and top down, or whether you think distributed, collaborative, and peer to peer. This is purely it. In the cities where we're beginning to do this, and I'll mention this in a minute, we have some center right regimes and some center left regimes. It is all about a generational shift. On the internet, young people don't say, I'm center right or center left. They're either into collaborative spaces or they're not. They're into shared commons or they're not. The music companies didn't see file sharing coming. Then they tried to legislate against it. But apparently, millions of kids have nothing else to do after school, little kids, but find new software to get it for free. You can't beat millions of little Lilliputians. That's all they're doing all day long. <laughs> so the music companies went down. File sharing won. Encyclopedia lacked of Wikipedia. Why would people be in an open commons? It's a tragedy, the commons. No one will work together. No one's laughing at Wikipedia today. And Bill Gates thought that Linux were some hippies from Scandinavia. Oh my God, people collaborating and helping each other on open source code? That will fail. Linux is a world player. What I'm saying is we can now take this idea and these business models to power the transmission lines and the cities will rethink this economic models for the rest of society. The reason we can do this now is something called grid IT. For 30 years, we couldn't answer the question. Governments would say, Mr. Rifkin, how the hell are we going to run a global economy on windmills and solar roofs and garbage? Let's get real here. We like them. They'll have a part in the mix, but they're soft. You can't run a global economy on these soft energies. You need coal, oil, gas, uranium, tar sand, heavy oil, shale, uranium. We can now answer the question, so you spread this back to your cities. It's called grid IT. We've had it for seven years. Thank God for the second generation IT revolution. We can now connect hundreds of thousands or millions and millions of little desktop computers with software. When we connect them, the distributed computing power exceeds anything you can ever imagine with centralized supercomputers. We can take grid IT now to the power lines in our great cities. If millions and millions and millions of buildings are producing just a little bit of their own energy, storing it with hydrogen like we store it with digital media, and then sharing some that they don't need at different times, the distributed power run by distributed IT on those transmission lines that power exceeds anything you could ever, ever imagine with centralized coal and nuclear-fired power plants. This is a generational shift. Those of us who grew up with centralized top-down believe that's the way you create power. We have a new technology revolution, a generation that believes it's collaborative, open source, and distributed. 